The recent cyber attacks across 150 countries have affected hundreds of thousands of computers. And in the UK, the National Health Service has been among the organisations that has been impacted. Well, with us is cybersecurity expert Paul Harris. He's the managing director of uh, the Manchester-based firm Sakama. First of all, what is this threat that's brought computers to their knees across the world? Well, the attack that happened on uh, Friday the 12th of May was a, a ransomware attack. It was called WannaCry. Multiple strains of ransomware attacks uh, are out there currently, and this was just one particular type that attacked certain versions of Windows software. How did people's computers get infected? So it was most likely triggered by a phishing email. 80 or 90% of attacks happen through uh, phishing emails and spear phishing where people are encouraged to either click on a link uh, or open an attachment which then downloads malware. In the instance of WannaCry, the payload as it's called, this ransomware software, then started to encrypt all of the files on the computer that it attacked. And that means they're effectively locked and you can't unlock them unless you get a decryption key. What this then went on to do, this particular attack, was then search search for other devices and computers on the network and start to attack those. So it spread very quickly. And then once it had attacked all of those computers, it would then start pinging externally and look for other computers to attack. You know, the whole thing could have been started off by one phishing email, which then just started to uh, spread across the globe. And do we know where this threat came from? No. I think when it started, like most ransomware attacks, the assumption was that it was uh, an individual cyber criminal. Uh, most of these particular ransomware attacks, uh, that's exactly what they are. Probably unlikely we'll ever find out for certain. There are some interesting theories, though, around uh, whether this is actually a government attack. So if you think about countries in the world that are sort of posturing at the moment and putting on big displays of their military capabilities. So North Korea comes to mind, obviously. The malware behind WannaCry was actually based on some malware that was out in the world earlier in the year in around January that was created by a hacking team uh, in North Korea called the Lazarus Group. People are linking these bits of information together and saying, actually, maybe this was state led particularly if you look at the type of people and businesses that were attacked, which were, you know, a lot of those were sort of national infrastructure type organisations such as the National Health Service, telephone systems and sort of transport, etc. Because I did hear some claim that, that maybe the Americans actually were the originators of part of the software. That's right, yes. Um, unfortunately, the NSA, the, so the American National Security Agency, was hacked by a Russian hacking group called the Shadow Brokers last year. In April of this year, they dumped all of the weapons that they stole effectively from the NSA onto the internet. So obviously what's been happening since then is that uh, all of the cyber criminals and the, and the sort of hacking teams and, and groups around the world have been rifling through this arsenal of, uh, of weapons that were developed by the American government for their own spying and surveillance purposes, weaponizing them and using them against types of attacks that will come from that, that arsenal of weapons. Now, given that the people who are doing this are asking for a ransom, can we not just see where the money goes and then we go and catch them? Unfortunately not, no, because the uh, cyber criminal's currency of choice is something called Bitcoin, which is a cryptocurrency based on a blockchain, the type of encryption. So what you can see is their wallet. So you can see money is in this wallet. So on the attack from Friday, there was about £60,000 put into this wallet. You don't know who has put money in and you can't see who takes money out. The reason that criminals like Bitcoin is because there is no central bank. So it's, um, it's very, very difficult to trace who has them. Um, and once you've got that money... Like most criminals, what they do is then uh, launder that through um, you know, one or two sources to turn it into cash. And once your computer has been locked, is there no way back without paying the ransom? The advice is don't pay. It does pose a quite a difficult question for you. If you're smart, you'll have kept backups, uh, you know, regular backups, and you'll have a system in place to ensure that you're able to reinstate from that, uh, from those backups. So it's a bigger problem for businesses. But if a business is regularly taking backups, and those backups are separated from the network, then you're much, much safer. So you don't have to pay because you can reinstate. Um, if you haven't got that, then you know, you are faced with a, a difficult choice, which is, do I pay? It's a relatively small amount of money. But at the end of the day, you're dealing with criminals and there's nothing to say that, that someone won't come back next week and attack you if you've demonstrated that you're able to pay. What are companies like yours, Sakama, doing to try to protect users against these sorts of threats in future? 
So we are a an ethical hacking company. So what we do, uh, I think, if you start from the with the assumption that you know one way or another as a business you're going to get hacked, and that's not me being dramatic. That's very very real possibility. You, you have a choice. Do I wait for the cyber criminals to do it, or do I employ um, a, a company like Sakama who will attack me and attack my business and test my website and my software and the databases and the infrastructure and products and sort of industrial control systems, test them in the same way that um, and using all the same methods and tools that uh, cyber criminals would use. We then find vulnerabilities, and in 16 years of, of testing these things, we've never um, a- attacked anything and not found vulnerabilities. We can then work with those companies to help plug those holes, close the gaps, and make them more secure. Shall we find out what the, the team here want to ask you, Paul? Kate, over to you. So I'm a Mac person. How at risk am I with this whole cybersecurity stuff for being Mac-based? I do have to step into the PC world occasionally for my research, but for the most part, I'm, I just use Mac. Yeah, well, there was a time when um, if you're using Macs or Apple products, you were you were safe. Uh, people didn't go after Mac users, not because Macs were any uh, any safer particularly, but it, it's about scale. And, you know, the, most of the world was on Microsoft products. So that was the way to uh, and that's get your biggest bang for your buck. Uh, but now there are, there's so many Mac products out there. Apple is being attacked as much as anybody else. Andrew. So my real concern is that I have to use lots of very old Windows computers for my work because they're attached to a piece of hardware which is worth a quarter of a million pounds, maybe more. We don't have the budget to replace the hardware, even if the computer's cheap to replace, and no one's going to write a driver for that hardware. So in a hospital, I presume MRI machines have this problem. What what can they actually do? Because they need them connected to pass patient records around, but at the same time, they can't go and buy a new one. That's right, and it was why the NHS and companies like that became vulnerable for this WannaCry attack because either they don't have the budgets or they have sort of uh, budget limitations placed on them that stops them from updating software. And eventually, if you don't update for long enough, your your hardware also becomes obsolete, so you can't, you have to update hardware as well. So it is a, a very real problem. What Microsoft have done following this recent attack is they've gone back to uh, software that that had been um, obsoleted by them so they were no longer supporting it and they have gone back and and created security patches to try and close these vulnerabilities down to make them safer but it's the way that software companies work they will only support a piece of software for so long and then they move on to their new product uh, and they want everybody else to move on to the new product so um You can protect yourself uh, to a degree by all of the basics that that we should be doing, which is uh, running patches on our software, particularly critical security patches, running antivirus software, having firewalls, having uh, strong passwords, not using the same password for for everything that we do, which is, you know, it's something that we all do because it's it's so much easier. But really, don't. and uh, have really good discipline about emails. I had a security company talking the other day, and they run phishing attacks on their own staff. So this, they're testing the, their own staff awareness. Will they click a link? Will they open an attachment? And even within a security company, their success rate was only 70%. So 30% of the people were still clicking and, and, and opening attachments. Goodness, Kate. So it seems like as an individual, the best way to defend yourself is, well, one, to do the things you just said, but also to have backups and multiple backups of your stuff and a system in place. But what I'm wondering, even if you have that in place, like are these attackers able to get your data or information off of your computer or is it just a lockdown? Like is any of your personal information at risk of not, not necessarily being destroyed but being stolen? Yes, everybody needs to step away from the idea that you can be safe online because that's a dangerous concept. You know, we don't expect our houses, for example, to be completely impenetrable or our cars. You know, we we accept there's a certain element of risk there. And it's the same online that in 16 years, we've always been able to hack into things. So cyber criminals, um, whoever they are, be they, you know, 10-year-old girls um, hacking into the CIA, which which has happened through to sort of uh, lone wolf cyber criminals to criminal gangs and hacktivist groups all the way up to sort of state-led. They are after multiple things. They're after your data. They're after um, credit card information. They want to try and get into your bank account. They're, they're looking to steal company secrets, military secrets. You know, we've all got things digitally that are valuable to us, and um, it is impossible to entirely protect them. It comes down to how valuable is it to you and how much time and effort and, and budget are you prepared to spend protecting it. 
And you can make it very, very difficult and you can make yourself safe from most of these types of attacks, but you'll never be 100% secure. Is it fair enough to say as well, Paul, that sometimes some of these threats, the worst ones, are the ones you don't know about because you could well have things lurking on your computer where the hacker has created for themselves access to your computer and all of your data that Kate's worried about and you don't know that and they can, when they want to, access your computer or call up your computer and use it to do their bidding from afar and do all kinds of things. And, and actually, we're not aware that's happening. Uh, that's very true. And that's that's the majority. The majority of cyber attacks are stealthy. They don't want you to know they're there. And again, if you think about it in terms of, of someone breaking into your house, they don't want to wake you up. They want to come in quietly, steal what you've got and be away with it. A ransomware is, is a very noisy attack because you have to be alerted because they want you to pay. But by far, the, the majority of attacks are stealthy. The Internet of Things, people are, are releasing devices at, a, at a, a fantastic rate. Then there's a rush to get products to market that connect the Internet with sort of whether it's a smart fridge or a smart doll or a smart meter. And these things are being developed in a way that's very, very insecure. So um, cyber criminals uh, went out and attacked 2.5 million devices, put malware on them, and then used those 2.5 million devices, which, which the owners of those devices were completely unaware of that they'd been infected, but were able then to point those 2.5 million devices and have them attack simultaneously individual websites, which created the biggest DDoS attacks that the world had ever seen. So so yet you don't necessarily know, and they're not necessarily always after you. They might just be taking over your machines to help them attack other people. And just to finish, Paul, and to focus people's minds, what proportion do you think of people's computers probably do have malware on them? If you took an average person off the street, and I appreciate this is a hard question for you to answer, but you know, plucking a number from the air with all of the risk attached there too, what proportion do you think? I think um, if you think that uh, last year 3.1 billion records were leaked, I think it's probably fair fair to assume that most of us have got our data on the dark web. It's been stolen at some point um, from either from us directly or from websites that we use, which is why it's really important to change that, the information that you have. And if you think in business terms, I've seen stats between 50 and sort of 75 percent of businesses in the UK reporting cyber attacks last year. So it's one in two or, or worse, uh, your probability of being attacked.